Hello. This is a pretty important episode. That's because I want to talk about this question. What is a friend? What is a friend? Really? How would you define a friend? Are there certain characteristics? Do you have so much history together? Do you spend so much time together? What makes a friend? Because I want to offer you a thought. I think that a lot of people are walking through life day to day, focusing on what isn't there when it comes to friendship. There is somehow an arbitrary marker of we are friends that I don't even think most people can articulate. And yet, there is, that's where we're focusing. We're focusing on what is not there. And doing that means we miss out on everything that is there. There is so much value happening in friendships before they hit whatever this arbitrary threshold is that we're just ignoring. If you're like, Alex, I don't know if that's right. Okay. Okay. Let me give you some examples. To most people, when they're talking, friendship is binary. Either someone is your friend or they are not your friend. Very rarely do people admit the gray area. Very rarely do people say, well, they're kind of my friend. No. People say, oh, yes, they're my friend. Or, I don't think they're really my friend. And we've created this yes or no when most people can't even explain what turns a no into a yes. Work friends are another great example. This happens all the time. Where I'll be talking to someone and somebody will tell me they don't think they have any friends anymore. Yes, that is a real conversation I have with people quite regularly. And some people don't. And if that's you, please keep following along and hopefully this will help you. What often happens is people will tell me they don't think they have any friends anymore. And then after a minute or two, they'll say, well, I guess I work friends. Are those friends? And again, they don't know. They don't know what their marker is of we are friends. And they see it as a two-option system. So instead of appreciating whatever is there in this work friendship, they're just focused on the fact that it doesn't meet some marker they don't even know exists. This is costing us. Arbitrary, we are friends without valuing all the stuff that exists before you get there, it's costing us. Because when you don't appreciate those small values that are adding up, it causes you to hold back. Some examples of this. If you don't see this simpler new friendship as providing some value, you probably aren't going to want to invest a lot of time in it. You're not going to, you're going to hold back in moments where you could show up for somebody. So if something happened, if they got in a car accident, lost a loved one, brought a new baby home, good and bad, you might find yourself saying, oh, well, I don't know them well enough to lend a hand. So we're holding back opportunities versus saying, you know, I really appreciate that I see them in my neighborhood all the time. That is valuable. And I can show up for them in a small way in this moment. If we noticed and appreciated what is there, we'd probably be more likely to act. And those small actions would add up. Whether they ever progressed to a closer friendship or not, it could just mean that this simpler friendship provides value in simple ways in our everyday life. It could mean that this neighbor is the person you can now call when you're out of town and you realize you need somebody to take your trash can out. That's valuable. Haven't we all been there? Like a package arrives 
oh, shoot. How am I going to get that inside? I'm still gone all weekend. The other way that this is costing us is we are overwhelmed. Needing to get to this arbitrary marker of friendship, whatever that is to you, and it's going to be different for everyone, by the way. My definition, my markers are going to be different than yours, and mine are also probably different within different relationships. But if we hold out to this marker, whatever it is, especially if we don't know what it is, we get overwhelmed by all the work it takes to get someone to our definition of a friend. If you think about your closest friends, you probably feel like you are connected in a lot of ways. That is a lot of time and energy. Do you want to invest that? You don't know how this friendship is going to turn out. You might be friends with them for a year and it never really goes anywhere. And then you feel like you've wasted your time because it didn't get to that marker of friends because it didn't continue versus just appreciating the value it brought. When you appreciate the small values that friendship bring, the time investment is a lot less overwhelming. You're seeing small value. You can show up in small ways. And over time, those will add up to bring meaning in some way, shape, or form. There's a lot of things out there that bother me about the way we talk about friendship in books and articles and things like that. And one of them is this stupid stat about how many hours it takes to make a friend. I don't even remember how many hours it is. 200 or something. That's a lot of time to look at and think, oh, am I actually going to be able to do that? Where am I fitting that in? So I wonder how much time does a friendship, if we are valuing these simpler friendships, I'd venture to say it's probably a lot less than we're telling ourselves. If we just committed to small actions and allowed them to add up and we didn't need to hit this marker that we don't even understand, that we would just start doing it and we would let it be what it is and we would create value over time instead of ticking off every hour till we hit that 200 and then trying to decide if we met the marker of friendship. So the other reason this is costing us is because it's warping our sense of time. Okay, so our closest friends, we love them because at one point in life, whether that is now or previously, we spent a lot of our time together. We did things, right? College friends, you went to the grocery store, you walked to class. You laid around on the couch. You drove each other to doctor's appointments. And over time, you collected memories and ways that you showed up for each other. So I don't know where we shift, but at a certain point, we start to value the history, the amount of time we have known someone and collected all of, I call them emotional intimacy roots. You can find them on my website and in the show notes. And we value vulnerability, but that takes time to open up to someone. But it doesn't seem like we really value the present time as much at a certain point in life. Like I think as adults, that loses its luster. And because we want to just jump to the history and the vulnerability, we're not present as much in the moments. We're just trying to fast forward. A work friend is a great example of this. Work friends, you might be spending 40 plus hours a week with this person, experiencing a part of your life that it's very likely your close friends, family, romantic partner don't really know that much about. They are not a part of your work day. They don't know what the company culture is. Sure, you can tell them when you get home. They are not in it the way that a work friend is. So we are investing that time in the present with them, but because we don't have a ton of history or vulnerability, somehow we don't see it as valuable. People are asking me if a work friend is a real friend. 
So I just, I have this belief that if we untangle the ways we're connected, and this is through my roots, there are three ways, and I'm not going to lay them all out on this podcast, but you can go read about them. But if we untangle the ways we are connected, we will realize we are more connected than we initially thought. And that might help us to appreciate the spectrum of friendships versus waiting for some arbitrary threshold to see someone as valuable in our life. I think that the current working title is like the Your People Framework. And this includes everything from your family to your formal communities to your acquaintances, your friendships, your past friendships and relationships. And today, I just want to talk about the friendships. So the simplest is what I call a familiar friend. This isn't an acquaintance. A familiar friend is somebody that you see in the places you're out living life. So maybe a friend of a friend. You see them at your friend's parties, at their barbecues. This could be somebody you see at the gym. You're not very close to them, but you would recognize them and walk in. At your kid's school, when you go to the Christmas concert and you walk in and you're looking for someone to talk to and you think to yourself, oh, I could go talk to them. It's been a while. Some familiar details, but you wouldn't really contact them for any reason. You're not initiating a lot of contact. And most people would just be like, oh, well, they're not my friends. But when you walk into a space where you would otherwise know no one, these people provide familiarity and belonging and connection. These people are also people that could become potential closer friends. And yet, most people just think, oh, they're not my friends. But I'd like to challenge you to say they're your familiar friends. They are people that provide familiarity in places where otherwise you would be alone. The next are defined friendships. So these are people that you are friends with. You might have pretty high vulnerability. You might spend a lot of time with them. So you might feel really close to them. I call them defined because you only see them in one context, your work friends. You don't really hang out outside of work. You see them at work, though. They know the names of your siblings. They know your parents are coming into town. They know about your job. You tell them about the trip you recently went on. You share things with them. You spend a lot of time with them. They support you in career discussions. That is all valuable, even if they are not your closest friend. The next kind are present friends. And I think these are the ones that everybody wants. These are the ones that we are doing life with. I think for most people, these feel like the peak friendships. You spend a lot of time together. You talk about a lot of topics. You support each other. You share history. You connect in a variety of ways in your life. So you might, they might be a work friend, but they also are the friends that come over for a Sunday barbecue or you invite to a family function. Now, the thing is, nobody expects an athlete to sustain their peak. And I think that's sometimes what we expect out of these present friendships. We want them to sustain their peak. We want them to feel this good all the time. And with life's changes, it's very unlikely. People are going to move, change jobs. Have kids and shift the way that you spend time together. Find a romantic partner and suddenly you're not laying on the couch together every day. I mean, you could, but most people don't. I'd recommend it. It is unfair to expect these friendships to maintain their peak. And these are the ones where they've hit the threshold, I would say. I think most people feel like this is the threshold. But if it changes, then we're frustrated instead of just appreciating that it's different and still seeing the value that it provides. The final kind of friendship is historic friendships. These are the ones that were probably present friendships 
they could be defined too. But they're probably present friendships and something like changed. The ways you're connecting changed. So this could be your friend who lived nearby, you spent all sorts of time together, and then they got a new job and moved across the country. And that's that's change in the peak. This is what I was talking about. It is hard to sustain the peak. Things feel different now. They can't just drop by your house after work. They can't make every Sunday barbecue. And we have to grieve that they're different, but they're still valuable. These people still hold a ton of our history and memories and know us at a certain age. They still might be the people we call when we need support. And different isn't bad. Different is just different. And there's going to be a different peak in a historic friendship. And these simpler friendships might be a way to fill in the gaps. So if your present friend moved across the country and one of the ways you spent time together was paddleboarding, you could find a friend who's maybe like a defined friend, like a friend that you go paddleboarding with, and they may not be your closest friend, and allow them to fill in that gap for you. And even though they aren't your closest friend, they are providing value. You are providing value to them. You are spending time together, enjoying an interest. So as you can see, if we're looking at what is there instead of what isn't there, we're moving through our days, more likely to show up in small ways, we're less overwhelmed, and we're getting to the end of our days. And instead of having interactions and getting home and feeling that vulnerability of, oh, I wish I was closer to that person. Our friendship used to feel different. It used to feel better. What if you spent 90 seconds appreciating what was great about the interactions you had? Because if you did that, you'd be a lot more likely to send them a text, follow up, get together, find new ways to... I have talked a lot about finding the value you are receiving. How does it feel that you could just show up for someone in your ways. So what I mean by that is instead of starting a friendship and feeling like you have to show up in all the ways for that person, you have to try to get super vulnerable and get super close. If we held on more loosely instead of tightly gripping these friendships and we just got to show up in the ways we can and that was valuable. Our contribution was valuable. Doesn't that feel a lot more doable? More sustainable? You can just offer what you can and let that be enough. And then you can allow others to do the same for you. And that will all cumulatively stack up amongst the moments of life and allow you to build the support system you need. It's a lot less pressure, I think. So I try and see my own offerings as valuable, not what they could have been at their peak, at their threshold. Maybe I wasn't there today. It's hard to sustain. But instead, what I did offer was valuable. And if I continue to show up in small ways, small actions add up. Sometimes I think we forget that our closest friends were at one point just people. They walked down the hall, they were another person wearing a similar sweater, and we said hi. We sat next to them in class and started chatting. We learned we were both going to be on the soccer team. And back then, we saw that simple building as valuable, like there was potential. Maybe we can all move on with our day and just think about what is a friend? What actions are stacking up? that are valuable in your life, that make someone a friend. With that, friends, I'm going to leave you today, but don't worry. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.